Uh, hi everyone, good afternoon. Uh, please enter, uh, we, uh, we will make some room. Um, welcome to this uh, parallelization from the afternoon, combining economics and ecological sustainability. Uh, we will have uh, your three presentation, very interesting presentation on modeling work. Um, the first one will be uh, uh, made by Sebastian Van de Kampus, which is an uh, assistant professor in macroeconomics uh, at Alport. This is uh, 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 Denmark, uh, Denmark, uh, Denmark uh, so his research uh, focuses on the soft global system modeling uh, and uh, on Latin America macroeconomics. So, the last one was 19 minutes. So good afternoon to everyone. Thank you, the organizers, for having me today for the second So, uh, so the idea of this presentation of the paper I submitted is to build a simplified theoretical model and address many of the things that have been discussed so far in this conference. This morning, we had a presentation. Uh, Omer and also Anton Godan, where they introduced these tensions that peripheral economists uh, face in the context of the green transition and the tensions that the green transition implies, mostly considering the unresolved social and economic gaps that peripheral, peripheral economists still have. So what I present in this paper is not an applied model like they presented this morning, but it is a more theoretical framework that tries to conceptualize these tensions. I will be focusing in the case of South American countries because that is the, the, the region I know, uh, but as they were talking this morning in, in the presentation, uh, for instance, about South Africa, I mean, the framework might be applicable also to peripheral economies elsewhere. Um, I don't know if I should, yeah. So, um, there are a number of unresolved gaps in South America. As you can see, poverty, inequality, access to healthcare, gender inequality, productivity gaps, and so on. The traditional approach that heterodox economics have taken to solve these gaps is the idea that we need to, uh, we need the economy to grow more. We need to increase investment and we need to finance them. So that is the standard approach to solve these gaps. We need to grow more, to increase income. The thing is that, as you might be already aware of, in South America, uh, it's not easy to attain high growth levels uh, or growth rates in a sustained way due to the balance of payments concept that has already been formalized by Diamond and Clearwall in 1979. So that is essential. It is not possible for South American economies to continuously grow at high rates to close these social and economic gaps. So one possible way of solving this problem would be to increase exports, if that could be possible. But the problem is that the carbon intensity of exports of these economies tends to be quite high because their export basket is biased toward um, natural resources uh, exports, basically fossil fuels or livestock, mining and so on. Uh, so this tension can be phrased in the following dilemma. To increase prosperity, higher growth is needed, but given the current economic structure of this continent, this can only be done in a sustained way by increasing exports, which seems in conflict with reducing greenhouse gas emissions. So this is the the kind of tension that worries me, and I think that is underpinning many of the papers and presentations that have been presented so far in this conference. So what I do is to build a simple long-run model that tries to capture these tensions to see if there is any possible way out of this dilemma, if there is any way of finding a sustainable trajectory toward development or prosperity in the case of South American countries. So the model is based in a previous paper written by Porcelia Spinola in 2018. Uh, the main features of this model is basically the idea that the effective growth rate of the economy is binded by the balance of payments equilibrium growth rate. So exports grow at an exogenous rate 
and then domestic demand has to adjust endogenously to the growth rate of exports. So there, there is where we see the previous or third world dimension or flavor of the, of the model. The supply side adjusts to demand following uh, a Louisian closure, basically assuming that there is an abundance of labor in South America. So whatever the needs the economy has uh, of labor, there are labor or workers uh, able to, to supply. So there are no supply side constraints on this side. This is basically uh, taken from Spinola and Porcile. What I add to this framework is the idea that we might have like uh, several sectors in the economy with different carbon intensities. And in particular, in the case of South America, we can see that exports tend to be more carbon intensive than domestic demand. So that is something that needs to be incorporated mostly if a possible strategy or a possible development strategy is increasing exports. So that might be at odds with the um, compliance of the carbon neutrality goals. And the other thing I add is the prosperity index that you can see uh, there, because instead of focusing just on income per capita as a measure of development or prosperity, I try to include another dimension that is basically emissions, per capita emissions. So that key uh, variable that you see there is a prosperity index that is composed of two dimensions, income per capita and emissions per capita. So we have an economic dimension and an environmental dimension. And the sigma variable that you see there is the weight that society puts on each of these two dimensions. So if we have a sigma that is close to one, that would mean that the society is weighing more on the economic dimension than on the environmental dimension when computing their prosperity. So it is a subjective index uh, that in the case of South America, I would claim that sigma tends to be closer to one due to the unresolved social and economic gaps. So the population of this continent would prefer to increase income so such that the unresolved gaps are finally closed. So I have different scenarios for, um, for the green transition. I will just present two because I don't have time to present everything, but I hope that these two scenarios that I'm going to show are enough to, to give you an idea of the main intuitions underlying the model. So the first scenario basically consists on the idea of an export-led growth strategy, assuming that it was possible for these economies to increase exports. For instance, if they increase the exploitation of natural resources and the world is willing to uh, acquire the, the, the outputs, the exports of, I mean, coming from this exploitation of natural resources, what would happen? So let's see what we have in the diagram. Um, first of all, we have two diagrams, one for sigma lower than 0 0.5, that is the preference uh, of society regarding um, the prosperity index. So if sigma, re remember, if sigma is lower than 0 0.5, that means that society weights more on the environmental dimension than on the material dimension or economic dimension when computing prosperity. And the opposite case is in the case uh, that you can see to the right, where, there, where sigma is larger than 0 0.5. Let's analyze or let's stick to the left diagram where sigma is lower than 0 0.5. That is, society is weighting more on the environmental dimension of prosperity. On the top right panel, what we have on the axis is X and A, that is the growth rates of exports and the growth rate of domestic demand. The growth rate of exports is constant. That is given by the constant X line that you can see in the top right uh, panel. And that is given basically by the fact that the exports in South America are given by, according to Thirwell, exogenous elements, the growth rate of the rest of the world and the income elasticity of exports. So that is given. The higher the growth rate of exports, the higher the possible growth rate of domestic demand. That is what explains the positive slope of the A dot equal to zero or the demarcation line of domestic demand that you can see there. So in the intersection of those A and X uh, lines, we get the equilibrium growth rate of effective demand. And that is projected into the bottom um, right panel where we get a Y E 
variable, which is basically the growth rate, the long run growth rate of domestic demand given by the external constraint. If we project that into the bottom left panel, what we get is that for that YE growth rate of effective demand, we can have two different or several possibilities for the growth rate of greenhouse gas emissions. That is what I call G. G, small g, is the growth rate of greenhouse gas emissions. And I represent two possibilities. One that I call GS, so you can see in the bottom left panel, which is the growth rate of greenhouse gas emissions in the case of a sustainable economy, an economy that, for instance, have has a lot of carbon sinks or have structural parameters that make it more or less environmentally sustainable. GU is the growth rate line of greenhouse gas emissions for a case of an economy that is not environmentally sustainable. For instance, an economy that has uh, very little carbon sinks or that has a lot of pollution in its way of producing. So for instance, in the case of South America, GS could be the representation of Uruguay and GU could be the representation of Bolivia. You can see that for the same equilibrium growth rate, YE given by the external constraint, depending on the structural parameters of the economy, the equilibrium growth rate of emissions can be smaller or lower if the intersection or the relevant greenhouse gas emissions growth curve is GS or higher if the relevant greenhouse gas emissions growth curve is GU. So depending on the structural parameters of the economy, the same long run growth rate of income given by the external constraint can be consistent with lower or higher growth of greenhouse gas emissions. Since what we have in the axis in the bottom left panel are the two components of the prosperity index that I presented before, the intersection of the growth rate with the greenhouse gas emissions growth curves gives us the growth rate of prosperity that we find in each of the equilibria of the model. The closer we are, the closer that intersection, that equilibrium point is to what you can see drawn as the Pmax point, the better it is, because the Pmax point is the optimal situation of the economy. It is the point where pro prosperity growth is maximum. And why is this the case? Well, basically because in Pmax, we have a very high growth rate of income and a zero or even negative growth rate of emissions. So that is where we want to be. On the other hand, the P mean point, the red point to the left is the worst case now. Their prosperity growth is negative or zero because income growth is zero, but emissions are growing a lot. This can be the case, for instance, of an economy that is not growing, but at the same time is destroying its carbon sinks. So the closer the economy finds itself to the green Pmax point, the better it is for the economy. So imagine that South America tries to escape from this um, middle income trap or the poverty situation in which its population is uh, finding itself by increasing ex exports. Imagine this is a possible strategy. How would this uh, be represented in this uh, scheme? Basically, we would have like an upward shift of the X curve in the top right panel. That would give us a higher equilibrium growth rate of domestic demand and a higher equilibrium growth rate of output that will in turn produce a higher growth rate of, them, uh, of uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And depending on whether the economy is more or less environmentally sustainable, that is whether we have a relevant GS or a GU curve, then emissions will be higher or lower. Therefore, we will be finding ourselves closer or farther from the P max point, which is where we want to be, where we find that prosperity is growing at a faster pace and therefore the economy is finding its way into a successful green transition. So that is a possibility, but the thing is that by increasing exports, emissions will always be higher, given the current productive structure of the economy, where we have, as we were saying before, an export basket that is intensive in greenhouse gas emissions. So while increasing exports by increasing income growth, and therefore the economic dimension of prosperity, that is detrimental for the environmental dimension of prosperity. 
A second scenario I can show is a completely different situation, a situation where the region decides to go for carbon neutrality, the decision of having not only zero emissions at some point in the future, but also zero emissions growth by definition. So what are the implications of the carbon neutrality scenario decided by the region? So this is not the green transition imposed by the rest of the world, but the decision of each South American economy to embark on a green transition. There are basically two changes in the scheme that need to be implemented. The first one is that now exports are no longer exogenous because the fact that the economy now imposes this uh, idea of being carbon neutral requires that for any given rate of growth of income, um, exports need to be reduced or there is a trade-off between exports and domestic demand. If domestic demand growth at uh, growth at a uh, higher rates. So if A is higher, then exports have to be decreased such that emissions are not changing. So basically there is a sort of carbon budget that needs to be complied and the authorities have to decide the composition of domestic demand such that all the time greenhouse gas emissions are equal to zero. So exports again are no longer exogenous. They need to be adjusted to the new constraint that has been established, which is basically the idea of carbon neutrality. Of course, the implication of this is that the growth rate of exports will be necessarily lower and therefore the growth rate of income will be lower. So the external constraint will be more binding in the case of a um, um, self-imposed carbon neutrality goal. The second change that you can see is that we no longer have in the bottom left panel um, the different GS and GU lines that I was showing before, because now we have just one possible scenario for the growth rate of uh, greenhouse gas emissions, which is basically the situation where the growth rate is zero because it's, that is by definition what the country is imposing as a goal. So that's why the G curves are completely overlapping with the vertical axis in the bottom left panel. So basically in this case, what you can see is that normally the carbon neutrality goal would imply um, specific growth rate of uh, effective demand, YE, which will be normally lower than the one that we would explain or we, we would find in the export net growth scenario that I was uh, showing before. And even it would be lower than the growth rate of um, income that we have historically been observing in South America, which is not that high, but it would be even lower. Um, basically again, because we would be putting uh, a ceiling on the growth rate of exports that is possible and compatible with the carbon neutrality goal. Um, so the result of this second scenario basically is that the, um, the implication of carbon neutrality uh, would necessarily be a lower growth rate of income. And therefore, if we go back to the measure of prosperity, whereas we would be getting a better uh, performance in the environmental dimension, we would be getting a worse performance in the economic dimension. And that is most likely the dimension that the South American population uh, prefer to prioritize, given the unresolved gaps that have been accumulating over the last decades. So um, I will just jump to the conclusions because I, I won't have time. Uh, I don't know how, yeah. That was the plan to present just two scenarios. So basically, um, I hope this was uh, enough to give you the main intuitions about this dilemma and this impossibility of um, obtaining or achieving at the same time high growth uh, and environmental sustainability given the current productive structure of the South American economies. Um, the old strategies uh, that have been proposed for the development of the region, I don't think that they are no longer enough unless, as it was being discussed by Antoine and Oslem this morning, that structural change is accompanied by a green, uh, green structural change uh, flavor. I mean, it needs to be uh, thought uh, completely considering the change in the structure such that the all the activities, not only export, but also domestic demand, uh, become more environmentally efficient. And it is not clear how to do this. 
but ECLAC or CEPAL has been proposing the idea of a big environmental push. Um, and there you can find some of the ideas that could be thought or developed in order to um, make the transition possible. The transition path uh, that would describe the way out of this dilemma is the one that you can see in that graph um, in the dark green line, where basically uh, we would have like a nationally determined carbon neutrality with green structural change leading to a situation where both output growth is high, emissions growth is zero, and therefore the economy finds itself close to the Pmax point, again, the point where the growth rate of prosperity is uh, the highest possible. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, uh, Sebastian, for uh, this very nice presentation. Uh, I forgot to say at the very beginning, uh, we will save the question uh, for the end uh, of the presentation. You can also uh, react on the chat online, and uh, I will receive the question here on the phone. So we are moving now to the second presentation uh, by Daniel, which is on online. He's online, sorry. Um, so Daniel has a PhD in energy modeling uh, in system modeling from the University uh, College of London. He now works at the Institute of Sustainable uh, Resources uh, at UCL as well. Uh, so his PhD look at uncertainties in global uh, gas resources and market under different energy systems. Uh, and uh, Dan's research has recently, sorry, look at the transition away from fossil fuel. So then you have 20 minutes and the floor is yours. I think you can share your screen. Uh, you made some before, no? So I, I think I just need um, Sebastian to. Um, that's great. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, okay. Can everyone? Is it okay to see the screen? Yes. Brilliant. Okay, thanks. Um, so it's great to to join everyone, um, even if it's uh, remotely. I, I wish I was in Paris. Um, so my name's uh, Dan Wellsby. I'm a researcher at University College London in the Institute for Sustainable Resources, um, and I'm presenting today in lieu of um, Adrian Vochley, but the Inter American Development Bank. Um, so I hope I hope I do this presentation justice. Um, but essentially, we we looked at um, the the project was was a follow up to a, a twenty nineteen study, also by the Inter American Development Bank, which was essentially looking at uncertainties um, for the um, for Latin America and the Caribbean, looking at uncertainties around um, potential revenues from from oil production. Um, and looking at potential uncertainties around um, the revenues from oil production in, in Latin America and the Caribbean under different climate scenarios. Um, and then we followed that up last year with a working paper looking at um, similar uncertainties around the potential role of, of natural gas um, and the issue of, of stranded natural gas reserves um, within, the, within the Latin America region. Um, so I'll just begin with a with a with a bit of context. Um, natural gas plays a, a, a quite a large role in the in the energy system for for Latin America and the Caribbean. It currently accounts, or in twenty nine, it accounted um, accounted for around twenty five percent of energy consumption. Um, and one of the kind of key parts of that is is in the power generation sector. Um, and particularly, there's a there's a temporal aspect to that in the sense that. Um, as uh, countries which are heavily reliant on hydropower, for example, um, as, as hydropower kind of fu fluctuates between um, different seasons, natural gas kind of has a quite a large balancing role there, particularly, um, particularly for power generation. Um, and whilst oil has the has the largest um, provides the kind of largest part of government revenues from oil and gas as a percentage of GDP. Um, gas is, you know, gas plays a, a very important role as well. Um, and this can really be seen in, in, in Trinidad and Tobago, which is a, which is a large um, exporter of, of liquefied natural gas. 
um, and in Bolivia as well, um, which exports via pipeline to um, to neighboring countries in in South America. Um, so whilst oil is kind of the um, you know the I'd say the kind of um, dominant um, uh, fossil fuel in terms of in terms of government revenues, uh, natural gas also has a plays a currently plays a, an important role. Um, and then what we're seeing kind of currently is is um, is a significant amount of interest in in unconventional gas resources, particularly in Argentina. Um, so there's a very large shale gas play in Argentina in the in the Vaca Muerta, um, which has seen kind of uh, quite strong production growth in recent years um, and also strong growth in the production of, of tight oil. Um, and this is, you know, this was kind of started in, in North America, in the United States in particular, with the um, huge expansion of, of shale gas production and tight oil production throughout the, the 2010s in particular. Um, but finally, there's a, one of the main uncertainties in terms of the, the role that, that gas will play um, in, in Latin America going forward is, um, it is under different scenarios in terms of, in terms of climate policy um, and also the, the risk to, to, to gas investments from um, really um, rapid reductions in the cost of other technologies, namely, particularly in the power generation sector, wind and solar. Um, so, you know, the, the construction of more gas fired power generation, for example, um, is, you know, is it has a has a significant uncertainty in terms of the climate impact, um, but also in terms of the competition from from variable renewables in particular. Um, so, so the paper looked at, um, you know, looking into look, looking into uncertainties under um, different levels of climate policy was the kind of, um, was, you know, was the main kind of driver of these scenarios. Um, so the research really assessed the, the prospects for natural gas production um, and, and the revenues from that. So the revenues from production, which go to individual governments um, under emerging uh, climate regimes in Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, and to do this, we use the XLRM framework, which was developed by, um, I believe, Robert Lempert in 2003. Um, and that essentially looked at external factors, which um, in our case was, was climate policy, whether that's kind of coming at a, at a country and regional level or as a, as a kind of a global climate policy. Um, we then ex explore different policy levers, in this case, um, different fiscal regimes for, for natural gas, um, and particularly looking at um, different tax levels for, for natural gas. Um, we also looked at the, you know, the relationships in the system, so essentially the relationships between different producers in, in Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, and to do that, we used a, a model called GAPTAP, which is the... Um, global annual production trade and pricing model, which I'll, which I'll discuss a bit more briefly in, in a second. Um, and then the final part of the XLRM, XLRM framework is to look at performance metrics. Um, and the metrics we really looked at were uh, gas production at a country level under these different climate scenarios um, and tax revenues at a, at a country level as well. Um, based on the the level of production, which each um, which each scenario um, you know said was feasible. So I'll just talk very briefly about the models um, that we use to to explore this um, this uncertainty framework. Um, so the the primary model we used is is GAPTAP, as I said. Um, GAPTAP is a a geological economic model of um, global natural gas resources at a field level. So essentially, GAPTAP takes um, takes regional um, demands for for natural gas under different climate scenarios, and it will essentially invest in um, in in field level production capacity to meet that level of demand. Um, and within the model as well, there are um, different price formation mechanisms for natural gas globally. Um, and by that, we mean looking at, um, for example, long term oil index contracts. Um, domestic demand, so domestic production, and also uh, gas, which is traded on, on a spot market. Um, so there'll be different regional spot markets for natural gas um, and different price formation mechanisms um, within international gas markets. 
and essentially gapped up then outputs um, regional price levels and uh, production levels at a, at a country level as well. So that was kind of the primary model that we used, um, but this was used alongside a global energy system model called TAM-UCL. Um, TAM is a, um, is a linear optimization model, which essentially um, provides a um, least cost global energy system um, for a certain exogenous assumption about energy demands going forward out to 2100. Um, and the model is um, has a 16 region representation of the world. So it's quite aggregated. Um, there, there is, for example, a, a single region for Central and South America. Um, but Mexico is, a, is an individual region within the model. Um, so essentially what TAM doesn't have is kind of a granular um, representation of, of gas markets, which, which GAPTAP can represent. And then the second um, model that we used in, in conjunction was, was an oil field model called Buego. Um, that's the bottom up ecological and, um, or sorry, economic and geological oil field model. Um, and we use that to inform country level volumes of associated gas production. Um, so associated gas is, is natural gas, which is produced as a byproduct of oil production. Um, and it's, it's in it, generally it's, it's quite an important part of a gas production in, in Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, so, for example, in, in Mexico and Brazil, it can account for 70 to 80 percent of total gas production um, is, is associated with oil production. Um, and there's huge uncertainties about the role of that going forward, depending on the level of, of climate policy. Um, so I'm going to run through run through some of the results. Um, so the first results that, that, that we kind of looked at were from from our global energy system model. So from TAM UCL. Um, and we, we essentially explored four main um, four main scenarios looking at different climate futures. Um, we looked at a reference scenario, which essentially is, is business as usual with no, um, no climate policies uh, within the model. Um, and those are the, the, the black lines in the, um, in the two figures on this slide. We then looked at a, an NDC scenario. Um, and essentially that means that the, the nationally determined contributions, which were um, first enacted in, in Paris in 2015 and have been updated um, since then as recently for some countries as, um, as 2022. We essentially looked at um, a scenario where those, are, um, those policies are enacted to 2030, um, but then they are not ramped up in, in ambition beyond there. So essentially those commitments are kind of extrapolated out to, to 2100 in the, in the energy system model that we have. Um, we then looked at a two degree scenario um, and the carbon budget for that was taken. There is essentially a global carbon budget implemented for that scenario. Um, and that's taken from the um, IPCC analysis. And then finally, we looked at a, a Paris compliance scenario, which is below two degrees, which is the blue lines that you can see. Um, and that's a, a, again, a global carbon budget from 2020 of 800 gigatons. Um, and essentially, that's the, the only, the only um, scenario that we look at, which can really be considered Paris compliant. It results in, in, in warming of around, I think, 1.65 or 1.7 degrees by, um, by uh, 2100. Um, so it's, it's really maintaining that um, well below two degree target or, or limiting um, that was first uh, agreed upon in, in Paris in 2015. And essentially what we can see from these two figures on, on the left hand side and the right hand side is that um, gas production in Latin America and the Caribbean and gas consumption is really heavily influenced by the level of climate policy. Um, so on the in the in the below two degree scenarios, as I said, you can see that essentially from from 2020, um, we're seeing quite rapid reductions in gas production and gas consumption. Um, but if we contrast that to to the reference scenarios where there is no inaction of, of global of, of climate policy, whether at a regional level or a global level, um, we see quite strong growth in in production and consumption. So those are the outputs from, from, the, um, from the energy system model, which I said has quite an, an aggregated view of, um, of Central and South America as a, as a single region. Um, 
So what we then try to do is to look at these in a bit more detail in terms of the granularity, in terms of um, individual countries and what that might mean for individual countries. Um, and what we generally found was that the largest swings or the largest kind of variations in country level production um, was in particularly in Argentina. And that's really driven by variations in the amount of uh, shale gas production in Argentina, depending on the, the level of um, climate ambition that we, we imposed on the modeling. So I think if you look in the top, top left hand corner of this um, four, um, four panel figure, you can see there that in the, um, in the NDC, which is the red lines, and in the, the reference scenarios, which is the black lines, um, in general, um, Argentina uh, gas production is, is, is significantly higher than it is in the, um, in the blue and the green lines, which is the, the two degree and the below two degree scenarios. So essentially, in our, in our most stringent climate policy cases, in our, in our blue scenarios, in our below two degree scenarios, we really see very limited room for shale gas production from, um, from Argentina in, in those cases. Um, and we see similar uh, variations in, in Brazil, for example, um, but Brazilian production is largely dependent on, on associated gas production. Um, so that is, is gas, which is produced as a, as a byproduct of oil. Um, and I think probably the final um, impact in terms of the, in terms of the looking at the, um, the outputs from, from GAPTAP is that these, um, this slide shows um, discounted cumulative revenues from 2017 to 2035. Um, so this is uh, Latin America and the Caribbean taken as an aggregate. Um, and essentially what we see is that median revenues in our below two degree scenarios um, and our two degree scenarios where there is quite strong climate policy, um, what we see is that certainly median levels of, um, of cumulative revenues are significantly lower than if we have um, less stringent or less ambitious climate policy. Um, so essentially what we see is that median revenues for, for scenarios with, with limited climate policy lead to between 90 and $140 billion, um, and that reduces to, to 78 to 80 billion um, for, for scenarios which are, which are Paris aligned. Um, so essentially in, in what we're seeing is that if, if global, um, if the global climate and the damage to the global climate is to be limited to the greatest possible extent, um, and, and global climate policy and regional climate policy is as it needs to be very strong, um, you know, essentially that, you know, governments can't really rely on higher revenues from, from natural gas extraction, and that includes exports. Um, and finally, I'll finish off with, with this slide. Um, so what we looked at was, was cumulative revenues from natural gas production, um, and we looked at um, cumulative production from natural gas uh, production. And essentially what we were able to do then is to show how much of the natural gas reserve base would need to stay in the ground um, or would need to stay unextracted um, if, if the um, Paris um, target of keeping global temperatures to well below two degrees is to be realized. Um, and essentially what we found, and there are quite significant uh, variations at a country level, um, but in general across the region, what we see is um, 39 to 50% of, of um, free P, so that's kind of the, um, that's um, free P essentially means that it's um, normally 1P is used for natural gas reserves. It's essentially the, the confidence that we, that we put towards the, um, the estimate that we're making. Um, so 3P would be kind of the wider reserve base. Um, what we essentially see is that um, excluding Venezuela, because Venezuela makes up the, the vast majority of, of the gas reserve base um, in, in Latin America and the Caribbean, what we see excluding Venezuela is that between 35 to 50 percent of natural gas reserves would need to remain in the ground or stranded in, in a Paris aligned scenario. Um, and if you include Venezuela in that, then, then it increases to, um, to around 70%. Um, so, you know, within the region, there's a, there's a very large amount of natural gas, which would need to be stranded if the, if the Paris target is, is to be met. 
Um, but but as as I said earlier, Ron, you know, there are quite significant variations between different countries in that level of um, of unextractable or unburnable natural gas. So I'll just finish off with some with some key conclusions here. Um, as I said, you know, production varies significantly across countries, um, particularly for unconventional gas production. And that's really driven by the by the level of climate policy across our scenario, um, our scenarios that, that we've explored. Um, we do see a significant range of, of discounted fiscal revenues across the scenarios. Um, but again, this is really being driven by the, the level of climate policy um, and also the, the level of, of demand or energy service demands that we see um, going forward. Um, so, so as I said on, on a previous slide, you know, in our, in our reference and NDC scenarios, we see um, production and consumption of gas between 14 and 70% higher than 2018 levels. Um, and, and in our below two degree scenarios, we see a complete reverse of that to, to consumption and production 30 to 45% lower than, than 2018 levels. Um, and finally, achieving the Paris Climate Agreement um, you know, would suggest that a significant proportion of, of um, gas reserves in Latin America and the Caribbean would need to, need to remain in the ground. Um, so I'll say I'll, I'll stop there because I think I've I think I've had my um, my my twenty minutes, but I'll, I'll leave um, some of some of the details of of some of the work that we've done, including the the working paper that that formed the the basis of this presentation, um, and there's also the the paper um, the previous paper on on oil in Latin America. If that is of of interest to anyone, that's also um, provided in in the slides here. Um, so thank you very much for listening and I uh, look forward to any questions at the end. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel, for uh, this presentation. Uh, I will uh, now give the floor to David. Sorry, I'm creating chaos. <laughs> The name is uh, Senior Economist here at ID, work on the Jim Modeling team. And it will give you an overview of the work. Yes. <laughs> Ever watching. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. So uh, Devin is working on the gym gym um, model and at national scale, and he will give you an overview of the work made on Tunisia. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, thank you for this for this presentation. As Gael said, I am working on Tunisia, and today I'm going to be presenting the Jam Tunisia project, which is uh, about uh, the loss of agricultural production. Particularly, the topic here is not energy. We talk a lot of energy, but now I'm going to talk agriculture and the climate impact of climate change on Tunisian agriculture and its effects on the macroeconomy. As I said, this is an official JAM project that we've carried out in Tunisia in partnership with ITSEC, which is a semi-public uh, research institute in Tunisia, and the Ministry of Economy and Planification and Ministry of Agriculture, actually, where I've been our partners. This is a project that has been going on for three and a half years, and, and it's finally finished. So I'm going to be presenting the results of what we have found. Um, next month, we should be releasing the paper with the full model. And these are my colleagues that I have worked with. We have three colleagues from ITSEC, uh, from Tunisia, and Elias Mantes, who also presented in the morning. So the context, uh, or what are we doing, or what we are really interested in is, there's a few questions that we're interested in. One is what will be the impact of climate change on crop yields in Tunisia, because as I'm going to show, 
Tunisia is one of the most heavily impacted countries when it comes to climate change and agriculture because of particularly global warming and the loss of precipitation. And I'm going to show you some projections that we used. Some are from about the crop projections, some are coming from FAO's projections, some are from another project funded by the AFP called Adaptacion. I'm going to be showing you simulations of what will be the impact of no action if actually Tunisia does nothing about this, what's going to be the macroeconomic impact of it. And then I'm going to show simulations about the long run adaptation policy envisaged by the Tunisian government, because there is a long run policy, at least, that, that is being formulated, which requires a huge amount of investment in water resources, particularly desalination, simply because there's a loss of precipitation and dams don't do the job. So it needs desalination plants. And desalination plants, as some of you might know, are extremely expensive especially when it comes to a country like Tunisia. And then I'm going to be showing simulations about two possible ways of financing this adaptation policy, which is hugely costly. One is via concessional loans, via development banks, uh, or any other instant international institutions at low cost, low cost foreign exchange lending, particularly lending in foreign exchange. This is critical that if the money has to be lent in foreign exchange, and another scenario where the adaptation policy is partially financed, half financed by climate funds in the form of donations, basically. This was what was discussed in COP27, as you might know, the aid that is supposed to go to the developing economies. So a little bit of context, I'll pass these quickly. Uh, just some numbers about the scale of the problem. The agriculture sector represents about 10% of GDP as of 2018, and about 15% of employment. And food exports represent 10% of total exports of the country, and it's mainly olive oil dates and fishery. It's almost entirely olive oil dates and fishery and nothing else, basically. And the food balance represents about 10% of the overall trade deficit, but the trade deficit is around 13% of GDP. So when you take 10% of it, it's, it's, it's quite significant. And uh, and the most important one of the most important things is that at least two of the most important things is that the rate of dependence on cereal imports is at 61%, meaning that only 40% of the cereal consumption in the country is domestically produced, 60% is imported, and, and the irrigated agriculture only represents 10% of arable land. It's very, very small, and yet it uses 80% of all available water in the country. So just to give you an idea of the scale of the problem, the problem is pretty severe in that sense. Here is some climate scenarios for Tunisia, just to show you how bad things will get eventually. And on the left, you see the RCP 4.5 scenario, which is pretty irrelevant. So I'm not going to talk about this because you're never going to get RCP 4.5. So you can look at the right hand side, you can see the increase in temperature, expected increase in temperature by 2050. That's the first pa panel A on the right hand side, the graph A and the graph B is until 2100. So the expected warming lies between 2 to 2.3 degrees until 2050. And when you go to 2100, it's between 4.5 and 5.2 degrees, basically. And you can see you can see which parts of the country is actually getting getting hotter and hotter as, as time passes. This is the same graph for precipitation. Again, you could look at the right hand side of the RCP 8.5. You can see the loss of precipitation is between 1 to 14 percent until 2050 and 18 to 27 until 2100. And keep in mind, we're already talking about a country that is deprived of water resources. So these, these values are quite significant. And the other problem is that it's not only the loss of precipitation, it's the irregularity of precipitation that causes a problem because the rain does not, it doesn't rain gradually and consistently, but rather it doesn't rain, it doesn't rain and there's flooding afterwards, which of course does not really help with the agricultural production. So, so this is the scale of the problem. So what we did is we used multiple crop, pro crop production projections from FAO and Adaptacion. These are the crops, crop projections that we have been looking, we have looked at soft and durum wheat, barley, olives, tomato, potato, dates, citrus fruits, fish, cattle, sheep, goats, poultry, other vegetables and other fruits, which more or less cover 90 plus percent of everything that's produced in Tunisia, 
So what we did was we got all the projections until 2050 of these crops and, and it's not just crops, of course, there's animal production there as well. And then we actually aggregated these into tons and then we turned them into volumes, economic volumes. So this is the same, this is the projections in a, in a single graph. The black line is business as usual. And in our case, business as usual means no climate change at all. So if there was no climate change, what you would observe is that Tunisian agricultural production would grow like the black line, the dark blue line. And the orange one is RCP 4.5 and the red one below is RCP 8.5. That's where agricultural production is supposed to go over time until 2050. And as I've said, what we are going to do is we're going to simulate the red one, the one at the bottom, the RCP 8.5, okay? So what we did was to build a relatively large stock flow consistent model where we have seven institutional sectors. When I say seven sectors, I mean institutional sectors, that is agriculture, processed food, none. We actually have a specific, we, we divided the uh, food production into two. We have an agricultural sector, which produces the food, but we also have a sector called agro-industry, which processes the food. And as you know, most of the stuff we eat, we don't directly eat them because you don't need to eat. Uh, we turn it into flour, pasta, whatever. And so that's the agro-industry. So we have agricultural sector, agro-industry, the rest of the productive sector, households, banks, central bank, governments, and the rest of the world. So it's a relatively large seven sector. Three productive sectors are the ones I counted, agriculture, agro-industry, and the rest. And four different goods, the three goods of these sectors, plus a public good that is produced by the government, all the public services that is produced. As I've said, the model is fairly big. It's 120 equations with 81 differential equations. And what we did was to actually calibrate the model for Tunisia, because as you know, one of the biggest problems in, in economic modeling is to find your parameters for the model. So, and since we work with differential equation systems, the usual econometrics, econometric methods don't work actually. So none of those master level error correction models or whatnot, those things don't work because we cannot use these techniques to estimate differential equation systems. But there are techniques developed by engineers, particularly, to fit differential equations to data. So this is one of them, covariance matrix adapt CMAES that you're seeing in the middle. It's the stochastic calibration methods, covariance matrix adaptation evolution strategy. That's what the CMAES stands for. It's a distance minimizing algorithm to fit differential equations to data. That's exactly how we seem to calibrate it. So we collected 20 years of time series data between 97 and 2017. We actually used our calibration program in R to match the data, to match the model to the economic data that we observed. And then we calibrated the parameters using these, and then we did the simulations. And keep in mind that for these models to run, you have to make some exogenous, some assumptions about the exogenous parameters in our models. What we, have, what we of course did is we got a projection of agricultural production until 2050. That's what I've just explained. And then we also use the past trends in agricultural labor productivity growth, because of course, labor productivity growth grows in agricultural sectors. So we use the historical trends so we are not modeling an endogenous labor productivity growth. We are just projecting the exogenous trends. And in terms of other sectors, we use the Tunisian population growth rate projections from UN POP. We, and then we assume the labor productivity growth until 2050. So this is not endogenized. The labor productivity growth is not endogenous in the model, it's exogenous. And for the rest of the world, we have to make assumptions about global food inflation until 2050 because we need a price for the imported goods, imported food, obviously. So we made these assumptions. I'm gonna show you the scenarios. And of course, we have to assume what happens to the terms of trade of, or in other words, what happens to the price of your exports versus the price of your imports, because you're exporting and importing different products. And as you guys, I will show, we kept the terms of trade constant. So we did not make any preliminary assumptions about these things. We assume that whatever the price of import growth is, that is also the price of export growth, so that we are not distorting the results. 
basically. So we just look at the climate impact and we made an assumption about the evolution of inflation of other imported products. And of course, we had to make assumptions about the growth rate of the world economy. It's not exactly the world economy. 90% of Tunisia's trade almost takes place with EU. So the assumption is really with respect to the growth rate of the EU. Uh, because of course, how much Tunisia exports abroad depends on how much the EU grows. Uh, so we had to make an assumption and we had to make an assumption about trading partners productivity, which is the productivity in EU. Here are some of the assumptions. So I'm going to show you three simulations uh, in the beginning. Baseline scenario one, scenario two, both of them are CP 8.5. The difference, as you are going to see, is that we have an optimistic RCP 8.5 scenario and we have a pessimistic RCP 8.5 scenario. The only thing we change is the price, is the inflation of agriculture imports. In one scenario, we assume that food prices grow at the rate of everything else, 3%. So EU's inflation stays at 3%. Food imports grow, the price of food imports grows at 3% in line with the rest of the inflation. That's our optimistic RCP 8.5. In our pessimistic RCP 8.5, we assume that food imports, inflation of agriculture imports, grows at 5.5%. So that's the pessimistic one where the food prices grow faster than everything else, which, you know, these days, as you know, what's going on with Ukraine and the, and the war is. 5.5% might even be at least actually annual growth of food imports because the, the ones that we observe these days as, are way, way higher than this, than this 5% annual growth. The rest is the same. As you're going to see, we are not assuming any catching up of Tunisia with its trading partners. Both domestic productivity growth rate is at 1.25% and the trade partners productivity growth rate is at 1.5%. So no catching up actually or no lagging behind. So we are, that what we are trying to do is really just to make sure that we get the impact of climate right, and we do not distort the results with, with these sorts of assumptions, really. And here is what happens. So the black line is business as usual, which is our baseline. And in all of the simulations, you're going to see that the black line flattens. The baseline is stable. There's a bit of fluctuation, but as you can see in the baseline, unemployment stabilizes at 16%. Inflation, general inflation around 4%, food price inflation around 4.5%, and again, agro-industry food inflation around 5, 4.5%. The blue line is our optimistic RCP 8.5 scenario, and the red is the pessimistic one. I'm going to mainly talk about the red because that's the most likely one in our opinion, really. As you can see in the pessimistic red scenario, unemployment by 2015 reaches 20%. Inflation exceeds 7% general inflation. But as you can see, food inflation, both in, both in agricultural products and agro-industry, is way higher. In agricultural products, it's around 9%. And actually, both of them are around 9%. And similarly, in the baseline scenario, the economy in, in, in 2015, in the long run, grows around 2.5%. percent Whereas in the pessimistic scenario, the growth rate falls below 2% in the long run. And maybe one of the most important results for us is the, what happens to the trade deficit, income account, and the current account. As you can see in the pessimistic scenario, the trade deficit reaches 14% in the long run and keeps on accelerating. So if I had continued with the simulations, things would have got progressively worse. We just stopped the simulations in 2050 because we are interested until 2050, really. And the same goes for the current account deficit. There is a worsening, gradual worsening of the current account deficit, reaching to 12% of GDP. You're going to see the similar results in public debt. On the, on the bottom part, you're going to see that in the worst case scenario, Public deficit reaches to 14, 15% of GDP by 2050, and that shoots up public effects debt to 100% of GDP. That's the bottom right panel. The interest rate on domestic currency bonds reaches 11% in the long run. So you can see that the government budget is seriously deteriorated because of the climate impact. And maybe most importantly, on the top left panel, the effects reserves of the country is on is marching towards zero 
meaning that because the food imports start taking such a huge percentage of the imports that the country starts running out of foreign exchange. This is marching towards a currency crisis, if you like, eventually. And, and finally, public debt to GDP reaches 160%. Now, some of you might say that's too high. Nobody's gonna land to the Tunisian government at 160%. We could have imposed default, we didn't. We just wanted to show the scale of it, but the Tunisian government will probably have serious problems finding finding foreign lending at these levels of at these levels of debt to GDP ratio. As you can see in the top right panel, the food imports as a percentage of GDP reach to 12% of GDP uh, in the end, and per capita income measured in 2018 euros. So the numbers you are looking at is exact. It starts around 3,000 euros per capita GDP today. And in the worst case scenario, in 25, in 30 years, it barely reaches four and a half per thousand euros, basically. There's a huge gap compared to the baseline, and the country risk skyrockets to 14, 15%. And that, of course, again, creates problems about uh, financing of the public debt, particularly the public debt. So this is the impact of no action. This is what happens if nobody does anything about this. Now, we also, as I've said, we also simulated an adaptation policy envisaged by the Tunisian government. There is a water 2050 plan put in place by the Tunisian government. It's still a plan now. It's not really put in place. There's a plan actually to put this, this in place. And the idea is that the government will have to invest an estimated 1.6% of GDP in water resources per year. And as you can imagine, in 30 years, this is equal to 50% of GDP. Half of the GDP needs to be invested in, in cumulative terms in 30 years. And according to the Ministry of Agriculture's projections, this should push agricultural production up by 1% under the RCP 8.5 scenario. So that's what we simulated next. We make the government spend this money and we push agricultural production 1% above and, and to an annual growth of 1% beginning from today. Uh, but as I've said, we consider two types of financing. One is concessional lending, where the adaptation policy is financed by low interest FX lending by international institutions, development banks, and or via green bonds. And in the second one, we assume that 50% of the necessary adaptation is financed in the form of FX denominated climate funds as transfers for free, actually. So now what you're looking at is, again, the same simulation, similar simulation, not the same. The black is the baseline, the red is the bad scenario. The orange one is when the, when the adaptation policy is financed only by concessional funds, sorry, concessional lending, and the green one is the one where adaptation policy is financed half, 50% by climate funds and 50% by concessional lending. And as you can see, the adaptation policy will work in terms of bringing unemployment down. The adaptation policy brings unemployment even below the baseline levels. Uh, and of course, there's the positive impact of public investment here that is creating a positive em employment effect because it's creating demand in the economy and employment. And it pushes inflation uh, close to the baseline levels. Uh, the, the results in all the simulations are much, much better, of course, with climate funds. As you can see, the inflation under the green one, which is the climate fund scenario, is below the orange one. And the same is true for food price inflation, agro-industry price inflation. Uh, the same, uh, both policies lead to similar growth rates, but if you look at the trade, the current account deficit on the top and on the bottom right panel, you're going to see that the current account deficit is slightly better in the green scenario. And trade deficit and income uh, trade deficit is very, very similar in, in both scenarios, but the current account deficit is better in the long run if the adaptation policy is financed by climate funds. And the income account is much better, of course, because the government does not pay interest on the on the borrowing. So that makes the income account much, much better. 
And moving on, one of the most important things is that the adaptation policy makes sure that the country does not run out of FX reserves. That's the top left panel. As you can see, both orange and the green curve actually make sure that the country still has a positive amount of FX reserves as a percentage of GDP. The situation is much better with climate funds, as you can see, again. And interest rate on domestic currency bonds of the government stay much lower with, flood, with climate funds. Public debt deficit stays lower with climate funds. Interest rate on foreign exchange bonds stays lower with climate funds. This is all what was expected anyway, because it's partially financed by donations. And finally, public debt to GDP stays closer to baseline levels. Let me just say that even in the baseline scenario, the public, the long run public debt to GDP only stabilizes at around 120% of GDP anyway. So the climate fund financed adaptation policy keeps the public debt closer to these levels. But most importantly, both policies will keep food imports very, very low and brings the country much, much closer to sustainability in food production so that they do not have to import food. And the country risk is much lower uh, under climate funds once again, and per capita income is even higher than the baseline if the adaptation policy really takes place and it is funded at least partially by climate funds. And to conclude, as I have, as I have shown here, the impact of climate change on Tunisian agriculture is very severe, and it's going to have very serious repercussions on the economy if nothing is done. Just a quick note here, as, as you may remember, or maybe it was, it was not possible to see, I'm gonna go back to this, uh, to our assumptions. In both of our RCP 8.5 scenarios, we assume that the trade partners GDP growth rate remains at 3%. Now, this is pretty optimistic under an RCP 8.5 scenario, because if we are under an RCP 8.5 scenario, EU may not grow at 3% annually, in which case our results get progressively worse, basically. So I'm actually showing still a pretty optimistic scenario here. I'm not showing a terribly pessimistic scenario. We have made the EU grow at 3% until 2050. So if we change these assumptions, some of our results do change and things look even worse under that scenario. I'm gonna go back to my final slide again and conclude with this view. And the adaptation policies, as I've said, to eliminate the adverse impact of agricultural production is very costly. And, and, it, and it, it is costly even with low cost and concessional FX lending. Climate fund donations really help ease the pressure on public balances, especially, and reduce the country risk. So in our opinion, it is important that Tunisia benefits from these climate funds if these funds do exist or if they will really take place, these transfers, because it's still in the, in, they're just talking now. I mean, we don't know if these funds will really be released. But if they do get released, we believe that it is essential that Tunisia is allocated some of these funds, at least. And, and finally, it is important that the Tunisian government, governments in the future, not just the current government, but the governments in the future, engage in policies to increase productivity and agricultural production and the economy in general. Because as you've seen, even our baseline scenario is not really a terribly good scenario where the public debt reaches to 120% of GDP, unemployment is still at 16%. So these are important. And if the, if the country wants to secure food security and avoid balance of payment crisis in the long run, it is important to engage in productivity enhancing policies in the country. And I will stop here. I think I've spoken already a bit too much, but apologies for that. Thank you very much. All the presentation. We have a very full room, so uh, now we have 20 minutes left for the, the, the comments and questions and discussion. So, if you want to ask something, uh, I will take a three, <laughs> three uh, questions here in the room and then online. Don't forget that you can ask a uh, question and uh, I will get that. So, uh, yeah, I see Ken. Yeah, um, thank you for the. Uh, 
for the two presenters for the presentation. And uh, I will take a preference to an in-house question for Debrim. <laughs> uh, so um, the way I understand the adaptation options that you presented in Tunisia is that, uh, you know, as opposed to the energy system uh, where the transition options are, are very limited kind of from fossil fuel to renewable in uh, land use, Broadly speaking, the adaptation option, the adaptation options are broader, and uh, because uh, the land offers many ecosystem services. Uh, so I just wanted to. Uh, I understood that in Tunisia, what is considered is providing more water and more productivity. These are the two, uh, the two main adaptation pillars, I would say. Yeah. So, uh, is there any other um, adaptation or reflections where you would consider other land use? Because, as I understand, the, the, the objective is to keep the same um, production uh, system on food, uh, on the, the, the 10, uh, the 10 uh, different that you, you, you described, uh, and just putting more water and more, uh, more productivity. Is it really adaptation? We have this discussion in France recently in, with the big basin. <laughs> you know, is it, it only about putting more water in the system? Is it really adaptation at the end of the day? So it's not really about um, the methodology or it's more conceptual uh, question. And on the trade balance as well, if they put a lot of effort on desalination, what would be the impact on the trade balance as well as you may know, and on the energy sector, obviously. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other question? Yes. Thank you, Stefan. All the presentation was uh, amazing. I have a question because it was uh, very interesting for me, your presentation. However, I wonder that all the relationship was a two-dimensional relationship that we have in these uh, graphs. If we have another parameter and it would be three-dimensional, let's say uh, we don't have this uh, relation that if something grows the other uh, minimum its size and etc. Then we have, let's say, a more complicated analysis. This uh, analysis may change. This is my question. If you have that uh, example, thank you very much. Okay. Yes, sorry, the question for Dave as well. Uh, just this uh, on the the two options for adaptation uh, financing. How do you explain that for trade and employment, it's, uh, it behaves better in the case of conceptual uh, lending mm -hmm. than in the case of uh, uh, funds? Uh, I have a, another question at the beginning of the simulations. It's like almost like a shock, a response to a shock. So, how, uh, what's the explanation for this as well? Is it the case that maybe you just introduce climate change uh, on period uh, one and space? Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, you mentioned this very nice uh, estimation technique, here, but you don't show how it uh, fits with the uh, data. You have to I didn't have time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's the only reason. Okay. okay. Well, thank you, Nico, for the question. Um, yeah, I think that the results hold because actually. The reason why I decided to build this paper is that last year at the FMM conference in Berlin, I presented a model along the lines Debrin presented for Tunisia for the case of Argentina, that is an SFC input output model in discrete time in my case, um, consisting of 31 sectors and 3,000 equations. And Peter Scott told me that it was fantastic to have 3,000 equations, but he challenged me to communicate the same ideas in a simplified form. No more than 10 equations, he told me. Is it possible to, to keep the intuitions without having 3,000 equations? So that, that is the reason why I decided to build something more simplified. When you look at it, yeah, you might think. Yeah, well, yeah, I, I want the three dimensions. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, this is my next question. Yeah, yeah exactly. You say it's too simplistic, but uh, yeah, it depends on the. I mean, normally I prefer to work. Yeah, with yeah a I think it was a very nice model. Yeah. For me, it was uh, one of the greatest presentations here, but this is my question because it was very interesting for me. Okay. Yeah, but normally my, my, my answer would be that, yeah, the, the conclusions hold because at least when I work with something bigger, I found the same. Okay, uh, uh, this is 
Okay, uh, I'll start by answering Jadiga's questions. Now, two things about that. There are short run adaptation. Now, here's the thing because we are simulating the model until 2050, okay, we cannot consider short run adaptation policies. There is a detailed short run adaptation policy put in place in Tunisia, which, which aims at reducing losses in production, in, increasing partially the arable land for wheat production and multiple multiple dimensions actually. There's, there's one for olives, but these are all for like four or five year plants. Mm -hmm. and, and we even tried to see if we can simulate these things, but then I'll have to cut the simulations in five years basically. Mm -hmm. And the only adaptation policy that is in place, at least that is envisaged as of now, is the one that I've shown in the long run. And because we're working with the partners, because the ministries are our partners, we have to actually work with them and simulate the adaptation policies and their impacts that they are planning. So as of now, this is the, this is the long run adaptation policy. There are shorter run ones, as I've, as I've told you, which, which take into account a lot of the things you've said. It's not just water, it's reducing losses, is increasing arable land, and there's a huge list of, of these things. We have these, these policies in front of us, and these policies have a much better quantification of the impact in terms of tons. Mm -hmm. They actually have, like, you have item by item adaptation policy, reducing losses, this much more production, increasing for productive land, this much more production. It was possible. I have those numbers. Even I didn't have simulations with those numbers, basically. But the problem there is this. If you do adaptation for five years, and like you cut the adaptation, the graphs go back to these ones. Because in five, in five years, everything is good. And then five years later, you stop the adaptation, and everything just turns like this. So, and I cannot show this, because this, this, I mean, this, this doesn't make sense, because you can't just show, because it's unfair as well. Because of course, five years later, there's going to be another adaptation policy. And it's unfair to the government or to our partners to just show results like this and say, you're still in trouble. Because of course, there's more. So we had to present, we had to simulate really long run adaptation policies. And this is the only long run one. And when we speak, when, when I spoke to my colleagues who are experts on agriculture on Tunisia, and particularly water, the fundamental problem of Tunisian agriculture, according to our partners, is the water. It really is the lack of water. And, and without solving this problem, there's no solution to the agricultural problem, really. And, and for exactly this reason, there's even, there were envisaged policies at some point about banning tomato production with public water. It reached to those levels that they wanted to cut the water intensive crops completely because they consume too much water and they don't bring enough, enough return. So that's my answer to you. And about Etienne's questions, the, the calibration procedure worked very well. I'll show it in the papers. You will see that it works very well. You know, I just didn't have time to populate this with a lot of more, more stuff. Now, why does the concessional landing perform better than the that's an important question. That's something I have noticed as well when I looked at the results. I saw that when it comes to, it's not the trade balance actually, it's unemployment that it performs better. Especially unemployment, in, in the unemployment case, concessional lending performs better than, the, better than the climate funds. But then there's a reason for this because when you do concessional lending, there is a real exchange rate depreciation, which is much higher than the climate funds. So the per capita income is lower so what you are getting is lower per capita income, higher employment. So it's like the, what you are getting is the trade-off, basically. So you get a choice, which is, and, and this is a choice that every developing economy has anyway. You can actually devalue your currency and reduce your un unemployment level. This is a possibility, basically. But, but is this a desirable policy? Not really. You know, it's lower unemployment, but lower per capita income. For us, what really matters is that per capita income results are much better. And about the, the, the behavior before it stabilizes, that's the model adjusting, because this is a disequilibrium model. We start from a disequilibrium. There's a lot of adjustment mechanisms in the model. And as the model adjusts, as the variables in the model adjusts, you see some movement. And once the adjustment takes place in the model, the model will flatten. 
The reason you're seeing the movements is because we don't start from a steady state. This is not a steady state. This is starting from the actual Tunisian economy today. So of course there's this equilibrium today. So you see a bit of a movement and then because things adjust and then it flattens. And I'll stop here. Just one more. on the, the capital the, the, um, of the um, desalination effort is on the one percent GDP. Uh, one point six percent. Yes. Yeah, one point six percent, and this is there. There are already desalination plant productions going on in Tunisia in Spax, yeah. especially, which is going to provide all the drinking water for Spax, and it's fifty percent solar solar uh, energy power basically at the moment. So we looked even at the costs of these things. This costs around 350 million euros to produce that desalination plant. So this plan takes into account that it will be partially solar powered. And just to say this, because you asked this and I forgot, what we assume is that adaptation policy is 60% import intensive. So th this is one of the reasons that you are not seeing very crazy improvements because we assume that 60% of the adaptation policy needs to be imported. Yeah, so that's why it actually makes the trade deficit. It doesn't recover that much, as you can see, you know, and that's because it, there's a huge import propensity. That's what's causing it. Yeah. Thank you. Je la question en anglais, mais est-ce que vous n'avez pas des maths réactifs comme la Libye a près de chez vous? Or is there no possibility to import the oil from the Arctic Libyan? Yes, maybe. Yes, maybe. Yes, maybe. But to be honest with you, that could be. But again, these are not among the among the the envisaged policies. Mm -hmm. and, and it's the end of climate funding. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we only simulated the policies that that are, that are being thought of at the moment to see what they they will do, rather than imagining our own adaptation policies, which we could, of course, but we didn't want to do that because we are working with our partners and we need to, we need to simulate the, the policies that they have in their minds. And this is not in, in their minds, at least as of as far as I know. Maybe there is, but uh, I don't know. <laughs> you know, I don't want to lie. Thank you. Uh, I see two questions here. Uh, Sorry, the yeah, so I had a specific question to Daniel. Hear us? Oh uh, yeah, I can hear. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I was wondering. So you showed us graphs uh, showing that, uh, for example, for you had different possible futures for the gas production in Argentina. You have a wide range of possible uh, production uh, values, and for other countries, especially for uh, Venezuela, you didn't have such a wide range of possible uh, uh, values for gas production. I wondered why is it in your model that you cannot play that much with the level of gas production in uh, Venezuela? Yeah, sure. That's a, that's a really good question. Um, so es es essentially, the, the, the Venezuelan production is, is dominated by associated gas. So the production level stays relatively consistent across the scenarios because associated gas is pretty cheap. Um, whereas in the, you know, so essentially in the, in the, in the low carbon scenarios, what we see is that there's a higher utilization rate of associated gas. Um, but because the demand is shrinking, that forms then essentially a, a more, a higher proportion of the total production. Um, so there's, there's less room in terms of, um, or there's less flexibility in Argent, in, sorry, in Venezuela, because essentially their production is, like I said, is dominated by associated gas, and that stays relatively consistent um, across all of the scenarios, but with the caveat that in the, in the below two degree scenarios in particular, oil production is actually declining, um, but the, the rate or the utilization of associated gas is, is increasing to, to partially offset that. Um, so it's largely driven by, by the cost of production and, th and the fact that in the model, the um, associated gas, although you have to build infrastructure, is, is generally cheaper than kind of expanding out unconventional gas production in Argentina, for example. Uh, I, think they really want to, to I have a, I have a question exactly on, on the on the same issue. I mean, you explained it a little bit, but I didn't exactly understand why do we see Argentina to be so heavily impacted compared to the rest? Is it because they are providing the cheapest gas and they are the first ones to be sacrificed, or or 
they are providing sorry they are providing the most expensive gas so so under a climate scenario they are the ones that lose so much uh, because the, the scale looked really really high compared to the other ones and i'm just wondering why argentina really yeah sure no argentina is the most impacted so essentially all of this is being driven by um, by the regional demand in the model. Um, and because Argentina, if you if you expand out shale gas, particularly as you, you know, as, as that you have to constantly drill wells, the rate of decline is quite high. So the production cost for, for shale is quite high. So if you have declining demand, essentially what you have then is that your the lower cost resources in the model will be developed first. Um, and then provide a, a greater proportion of the overall level of production. Whereas because Argentina, you know, to, to expand out shale gas, you would need high demand to warrant that in the first place. So in, in, in the low carbon scenarios, particularly in the, in the below two degree or the Paris compliance scenario, we're just not seeing that level of demand, which would warrant the, the, the corresponding increase in, in shale gas production. And that's why you see the, you know, the huge variation in, in those scenarios. Um, I hope that makes sense. No, it is. It, it's a price thing. It's a, it's a cost thing. It's the, it's the most costly one, so it's the first one to go. Yeah, kind exactly. Of. Yeah, yeah. Do you introduce kind of, you know, the, the domestic subsidy, the extraction, uh, for example, of um, shale gas, uh, which makes, uh, you know, the cost uh, more uh, competitive? You, you, do, is it an input of your model, the, the domestic subsidy system to the, to so the we gas did... sector? Yeah, so we, we didn't include a price, um, the, the kind of guaranteed price floor, for example, to unconventional gas producers. That's something that we didn't include. We did try to include things on the on the consumption side. So essentially to um, what we kind of used as a price gap approach um, on which kind of reduced down the field cost. So the output is kind of artificially or the output price for each field would be artificially low. Um, but we didn't include production subsidies, which which granted would would potentially make quite a quite a significant impact, especially in in Argentina, where they um, certainly until until recently had, um, you know, were kind of, you know, subsidizing the, the, the differential between the unconventional um, cost of production and the, you know, the the, the rate that um, consumers were being charged. So so that's that's a really good point. And um, we're currently actually going for a review process. So that's. Um, yeah, that's something that, that we can definitely take into account. So thank you. Thank you very much. I will take one yeah, the last super, question. Super quick question for thank you, Kastian. Kastian. Yeah. Uh, no, thank you. I, I know Sebastian from a long time, but usually he, he's to do the big models, but the great really small model now. The important question is how you think like, and it's and the next challenge. I mean, how, how to put the big environment, not push uh, in this model is easy with some additional question, uh, question there, or how do you think that, or in the current model, I mean, as, as a framework for analysis, it's amazing that you'll be going through them and I'm using that uh, all this year after I heard me that for the very first time. Now, how, how in the model, how, how, how about that, or in the current model, it's easy to implement? Yeah, maybe. actually, it is one of the scenarios I didn't show due to the lack of time. Okay. Uh, but yeah, I mean, one of the, the possibilities that I already explored is what would happen if um, exports are increased, but not because there is a deeper exploitation of natural resources, but because there is a whole structural change that allows the economy to become more competitive and more environmentally sustainable, and therefore um, producing more attractive goods for the rest of the world or for the uh, uh, neighbors. So uh, yeah, I mean, Theoretically, it is explored, and the result is that that is the only way out of the green transition dilemma. The more practical question, how can that be done in practice? Well, I don't, don't think no one yeah, no, no. has been. <laughs> yeah, but I think that there is our work as macroeconomists ends, and then engineers, or I, mm -hmm. that's their work to, to find a way uh, of inventing the new goods and services that can with all these uh, green structural change process. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, we are perfect on time. So uh, thank you for the three uh, presenter and hope you enjoy the session and, and uh, stay for the next session.
Thank you.